Who controls your computer? 40 years ago, people used to be very worried that computers would take over the world. They, they were very afraid, but now we know that computers do what people tell them to do and nothing else. But which people tell your computer what to do? Is your computer doing what you tell it to do? Or is it doing what Microsoft tells it to do? If you are running Windows, it's Microsoft that really tells your computer what to do. But if you are using Mac OS, then it's Apple that really tells your computer what to do. Or maybe some of the time it's Adobe that tells your computer what to do. Or a bunch of other companies that make proprietary software. Because if you are using proprietary software on your computer, that means the program's developer controls what it does and you, the user, don't. And that's why it's vital to use free software. Free as in freedom. Free software means software that respects the user's freedom and the social solidarity of the user's community. So it's free as in freedom, not as in price. Think of free speech, not free beer. If you want to understand the word free when it appears in the combination free software. Free software respects the user's freedom, but proprietary software keeps the users divided and helpless. Divided because they're forbidden to share it, and helpless because they don't have the source code, so they can't change it. They can't even independently check what it's really doing to them. And often, it does something rather nasty. However, what I've said is rather general. Software should respect your freedom. What exactly does that mean? I need to say something more specific. A program is free software if you, the user, have the four essential freedoms. Freedom zero is the freedom to run the program as you wish. Freedom one is the freedom to study the source code and then change it to make the program do what you wish. Freedom two is the freedom to help your neighbor. That's the freedom to make and distribute exact copies of the program to others when you wish. And freedom three is the freedom to, help, co the freedom to contribute to your community. That's the freedom to distribute copies of your modified versions when you wish. If the program gives you all four of the essential freedoms, then it's free software, which means that the social system of its distribution and use is ethical because it respects the user's freedom and the user's community. But if one of these freedoms is missing or insufficient, then the program is proprietary software, user subjugating software, because the social system of its distribution and use puts the developer in a position of power over the users, which means it doesn't respect their freedom. The users of that program are not fully in control of what it does. Thus, to develop a free program and make it available to others is a contribution to society. How much of a contribution? That depends on all the details but at least it's being offered to society in an ethical way. But when the program is proprietary software, its use is a social problem. If the program has attractive features, those are the bait for the trap. They attract users to give up their freedom and become users of this program. And really, that shouldn't happen. It shouldn't be done at all. The aim of the free software movement is to put an end to this social problem. All software should be free so that all users can be free. But why 
are these four freedoms essential? Why define free software this way? Each of these freedoms is essential for a reason. Freedom to, the freedom to help your neighbor, is essential on fundamental moral grounds so that you can lead an upright ethical life as a good member of your community. If you use a program that does not give you freedom number two, the freedom to redistribute exact copies when you wish, then you are in danger of falling into a moral dilemma at any moment whenever your friend says this program is nice could I have a copy at that moment you will face a choice between two evils one evil is to give your friend a copy and violate the license of the program the other evil is to deny your friend a copy and comply with the license of the program if you are in the dilemma, you ought to choose the lesser evil, which is to give your friend a copy and violate the license of the program. What makes this evil the lesser evil? Well, if you can't avoid doing wrong to somebody or other, it's better to do wrong to the one who deserves it, the developer of the program. You see, we can assume that your friend is a good friend and a good member of your community and normally deserves your cooperation. By contrast, the developer of this proprietary program has deliberately attacked the social solidarity of your community. So, if you are stuck doing wrong either to your friend or the developer, do it to the developer. But, being the lesser evil does not mean it's good. It's never a good thing to make an agreement and break it. Not even in cases like this, where the agreement is inherently evil and keeping it is worse than breaking it. Still, breaking it is not good. And if you give your friend a copy, what will she have? She will have an unauthorized copy of a proprietary program and that's something rather nasty, almost as nasty as an authorized copy would be. So, once you have fully understood this dilemma, what should you really do? What you should do is make sure you are never in this dilemma. I know of two ways to do that. One is, don't have any friends. That's the method implicitly suggested by the proprietary software developers. The other method is reject proprietary software. If you don't have the program, you don't have to worry what you will do if your friend asks for a copy from you. That is my method. If someone offers me an attractive, convenient program on the condition I promise not to share it with other people, I say no. I say my conscience will not allow me to accept such a condition. And that's what you should say too. And you should also reject the propaganda terms that the proprietary software developers use to demonize the act of cooperation. Terms like pirate. When they compare people who share software with pirates, what are they really saying? They're saying that helping your neighbor is the moral equivalent of attacking a ship. Morally speaking, nothing could be more wrong than that because attacking ships is very bad, but helping your friends and your neighbors is good. So don't call it piracy. When they call it piracy, say no. When people ask me, what do I think of piracy? I say attacking ships is very bad. And when they ask me what do I think of software piracy or music piracy, I say as far as I know pirates don't attack using computers or by playing musical instruments badly. They use arms. Don't fall into the trap of repeating the enemy's propaganda. So that's the reason for freedom too. The freedom 
to help your neighbor, the freedom to redistribute exact copies of the program when you wish. Freedom zero, the freedom to run the program as you wish, is essential for a different reason, so you can control your computing. It may be surprising, but there are proprietary programs that restrict even how people, the authorized users, use the authorized copies. And that's obviously not having control of your computing. So freedom zero is essential. But it's not enough, because that just means you can either do or not do whatever the code of the program is set up to permit. And it's the developer who decides that. So the developer still controls you, not through the license, but instead through the code of the program. But it comes to the same thing. So in order to control your computing, you also need freedom one, which is the freedom to study the source code and then change it to make the program do what you wish. This way you decide what your computing is going to be instead of letting the developer decide and impose his decisions on you. Now if you use a program without Freedom 1, you can't even tell what it's doing. Many of these programs have malicious features to do things like spy on the user, restrict the user, even attack the user. One proprietary program you may have heard of that does all three is called Microsoft Windows. We know of features to spy on the user. We know of digital restrictions management or DRM features designed to restrict users. And we know of a back door that enables Microsoft to attack the user. In fact, this back door is so gaping that Microsoft has total control over the user because Microsoft can forcibly change the software at any time without asking the user's permission. So that user may think he controls his computer, but really Microsoft has total power. But please don't think that Microsoft is uniquely evil and only Microsoft would do this. In fact, Mac OS X is pretty much the same we know of features to restrict the user, digital restrictions management, and there's a back door which allows Apple to forcibly change the software in any way at any time without asking the user's permission. So it's, it's just as bad. There's nothing to choose from between them. And this appears to be the natural end point of proprietary software. Many cell phones are set up the same way. There's a company that can change the software whenever it wishes, and the user who supposedly owns the cell phone has nothing to say about it. What is happening here is proprietary software is a system that gives the developer unjust power over the users. Now, when someone greedy has unjust power over others, what's he going to do with this power? He's going to use it to try to get more power, more and more, until he has total power. And that's what they've done. Several different companies in parallel. So this is what proprietary software tends to lead to. Total power, not just power that they shouldn't have. Now, I won't claim that all the developers of proprietary software put in malicious features. I suppose some do and some don't. But when the program doesn't give you freedom number one, there's no way to tell if it has malicious features in general. Once in a while, we discover some. But there are many programs in which we don't know of any malicious features, but maybe they have them or maybe they don't. We can't identify among all the programs without Freedom 1, we can't identify any that certainly have no malicious features because there's no way to check. But I presume there are some. The problem is you never know if the program you're using is one of them. But even though we can't identify those programs, I can make a statement about them all. 
their developers are human, so they make mistakes. And the code of those programs has bugs. And the user of a program without Freedom 1 is just as helpless facing an accidental bug as facing an intentional malicious feature. If you use a program without Freedom 1, you are a prisoner of the software you use. We, the developers of free software, are human too. So we also make mistakes and the code of our free programs has bugs. But if you encounter a bug in our code or anything you don't like, you are free to change it because we didn't make you a prisoner. We can't be perfect. We can respect your freedom. Thus, freedom one is essential, but it's not enough because that's the freedom to personally study and change the source code. What if you were one of those millions of users that don't know how to program? Then you can't study and change the source code yourself. But even for programmers like me, freedom one's not enough because there is so much free software in the world that nobody is capable of studying and mastering all the source code and personally making all the changes that she might want because that is more work than any one human being can do. So the only way we can fully have control of our computing is to do it working together, cooperating. And for that, we need freedom three, the freedom to contribute to your community, the freedom to distribute copies of your modified versions when you wish. This allows people to cooperate. Here's an example. Suppose a few people release a free program and a lot of us use it because we like it, but we wish it had certain additional features. Well, someone can start with this version, add some of those features, and release his modified version. And someone else can start with that and add some more features and release her modified version. And then a few people can start with that and add the rest of these features and release their modified version. And then we'll have those features and we'll say, thank you for cooperating to make these improvements. And thus, when we have all four freedoms, we, the users, are in control of our own computing lives. Now, all the users get the benefit of the four freedoms. Every user can directly exercise freedoms zero and two the freedom to run the program as you wish, and the freedom to redistribute exact copies, because these don't require programming. Anybody who can use the program can figure out how to do these things, and they do them. Freedoms one and three, the freedom to study and change the source code, and then optionally distribute copies of your modified versions, these entail programming. So uh, not everybody knows how to do them. And so there are people who can't directly exercise these freedoms. But when others, the programmers, exercise these freedoms and when they publish their modified versions, all the rest of us can then install those modified versions or not as we prefer. So we all receive the benefits of living in a society where people have the four freedoms even when we don't exercise them directly. In addition, those who don't know how to program and can't directly exercise freedoms one and three can indirectly take advantage of them. Suppose that you run a business which uses computers, as most businesses do. But suppose that you don't know anything about programming because your business is in some other field. Most businesses are not in the software field. They use computers, but they use them to do other things. Well, if you recognize that supposing the program were changed, your business would run more efficiently and you'd make more money, it would be worth it to you to pay a programmer to implement that change if the price is right. So if it's free software, you can look around for a programmer who's willing to undertake the changes you want or some fraction of them for a price you think is suitable. Then you exercise your freedom number two to give that programmer an exact copy of the version that you are using. Then that programmer 
exercises his freedom, one, studying the source code of that version and changing it to implement the changes you wanted. And then he exercises his freedom, number three, to give you a copy of his modified version. And then assuming it works, you pay him for this work. So in this scenario, you use the fact that other users have freedoms one and three. You pay them to exercise those freedoms for you, and so you get the benefit. An important part of free software business works this way, and this is why free software is of tremendous benefit to all businesses that use computers. They deserve the four freedoms, just as individuals in their non-commercial lives deserve the four freedoms, just as every user deserves the four freedoms. And the end combined result of the four freedoms is democracy. A free program develops democratically under the control of its users because all the users can participate as much as they wish in the social decision about the future of this program which is simply the sum total of all the individual decisions that people make about what to do with the program. By contrast, a proprietary program develops under the, <clears throat> under the uh, dictatorship of its developer, the autocracy of its developer, who uses that program as an instrument to impose his power on users who he can then bully, command, and mistreat and exploit. So on one hand, we have individual freedom, social solidarity, and democracy. On the other, we have a dictatorship. Society must choose free software and reject proprietary software. There's no excuse for anyone to have the unjust power that proprietary software gives to its developer you shouldn't let anyone have that kind of power over you so you need to reject proprietary software but society also should reject it the aim of the free software movement is the liberation of cyberspace and all its inhabitants we should all have freedom this is why in 1983 I announced the plan to develop the GNU operating system it wasn't just that I felt like developing an operating system. Of course, I knew any programming project would be fun if I succeeded in doing it, but that's not what it was about. The reason was for freedom, because at the time it was impossible to use a computer and have freedom, because the computer won't run without an operating system, and all the operating systems for the modern computers of the day were proprietary. So there was no way to buy a new computer and run it and have freedom. You always had to install a proprietary operating system and that meant giving up your freedom. So how could I change that? I didn't think I could change it by organizing a protest movement because too few people agreed with me. So instead I had the idea that I could change the situation by developing another operating system and I stood a chance of succeeding at that because operating system development was my field and then being the author I could legally make it free giving all users freedom and then everybody would be able to use their computers in freedom with the system I would write. So I decided to invite other people to join in the development to make it free software to be, sorry to to get it done sooner and I guess I should take that over I decided to invite others to join in the development to get it finished sooner I decided to follow the design of Unix so that it would be a portable system capable of running on various different kinds of computers because I knew that in five or ten years computers would be different. I wanted the system to continue to be capable of running on future computers. 
And then I decided to make it compatible with Unix so that the many users of Unix would find it easy to switch. And then I gave it the name GNU as a joke because GNU is a recursive acronym. It stands for GNU's Not Unix. Now this follows a custom among certain programmers in the community work, which I belonged to, that when you had to write a new program similar to some existing program, a humorous way of giving credit to the older program was you could give your program a name, which was a recursive acronym, saying that your program is not the other one. So I followed that tradition, especially since it gave me the opportunity to use the funniest word in the English language as the name. The reason this word is so full of humor is because according to the dictionary, the G is silent and it's pronounced new. So anytime you want to say, anytime you want to write the word new, you can spell it G-N-U and you've got a joke. Maybe not a very good joke, but there are lots of them. However, when it's the name of our system, please do not follow the dictionary. If you talk about the new operating system, you'll get people confused. You see, we've been working on it for 25 years now, so it's not new anymore. But it still is GNU. And it will always be GNU, even if some people make the mistake of calling it Linux. But how did that strange error get started? Well, what happened was, in 1990, we had almost all of the system, but one important piece was missing. So the Free Software Foundation hired somebody to write that piece. That piece is called the kernel. It's the program that allocates the computer's resources to the other programs that you run. Well, our kernel project took a long time. It's, it sort of runs, but it doesn't work very well, so we don't use it. And someone else wrote a kernel in 1991, and he released it under the name Linux. Initially, it was not free software, but in 1992, he changed the license and he made it free software. So at that point, the combination of the almost complete GNU system and Linux, this one other program, made a complete free operating system. And this is what made it possible for the first time to buy a PC and use it in freedom by installing a complete free operating system. A system which is basically the GNU system, but which also contains this program, Linux. So if you call it GNU slash Linux or GNU plus Linux, you'll give credit to the people who started the development as well as to the person who developed the last piece that finished it. Today, tens of millions of people run the GNU slash Linux system, maybe more than 100 million. Unfortunately, that's still a small fraction of computer users. And even worse, most of those people still use some proprietary programs, so they have not completely attained freedom. Nearly all of the hundreds of distributions of GNU slash Linux contain proprietary programs or install proprietary programs or steer users toward proprietary programs, which means that they're not entirely ethical. So on GNU.org or FSF.org, you can find the list of the few GNU slash Linux distributions which are entirely free, which don't recommend that people give up their freedom. If you value freedom, you need to use one of them. But above all, if you value freedom, you need to teach other people to value freedom. Because if there are few of us and we try to fight to defend our freedom, our chances of winning are smaller. But if we teach other people to appreciate freedom also, and they join in, our chances are greater. This is why I don't participate in advocating open source. You see, open source is basically a way of talking about free software, but hushing up the issue of freedom. The people who chose to start saying open source in 1998 were the people in the free software community that didn't want to raise this question at all. Somehow it made them feel uncomfortable 
or they thought it would make other people feel uncomfortable, or some of them wanted to distribute proprietary software and they didn't want their potential customers to see any reason to say no to it. So for their various reasons, they chose to forget about freedom. They chose to construct a different discourse which never raised this issue. Well, if people develop free software for those motives, their contribution is still good. But in the long term, our future depends above all on what we value. If we value freedom, we will make an effort to gain freedom and to hold on to our freedom. If we don't know what freedom means, if we've never even heard the concept, we are not likely to make that effort. So I came to the conclusion that there was simply no use in promoting open source. It was a distraction because it failed to mention the most important point. That's why I give speeches like this talking about free software. I hope you'll join me in spreading the ideas of free software. For more information, look at gnu.org and fsf.org. We also have sister organizations, FSF Europe, which is at fsfeurope.org, FSF Latin America, which is at fsfla.org, and FSF India, which is at gnu.org.in. Thank you very much.